about weather and the atmosphere, we have to talk about humidity. It's an extremely important part of the atmosphere. Now there's two types of humidity. Well, in actuality, it's the same humidity. It's basically two ways that we measure it. The first one is absolute humidity, or it, we just actually call this humidity. The amount of water in the atmosphere. Now this is absolute humidity. It's like myself saying to you that there is 10 grams of cubic centimeters of water in the air right now. So right now, this is how much water we have in the atmosphere. There's no mention of temperature, there's no mention of anything really. It's just this is how much humidity we have in the air at this moment. Now relative humidity, this is something that you normally hear about on the news if you're watching the weather channel or watching uh, like the, the weather on the normal news. This is the ratio of amount of water vapor currently in the air compared to how much the air can hold at a given temperature. And this is usually expressed as a percentage. So if you're listening to the Weather Channel, you're listening to the news, they tell you today we have 40% humidity, 70% humidity, it might be 90% humidity. They're really giving you the relative humidity about this. Now this is like saying that right now there's 10 grams per cubic centimeter of water in the air, but the air can really hold 20 grams per cubic centimeter. So right now the relative humidity is 50%. So it's just a ratio between what's currently in the air and what, uh, how much the air can actually hold. Typically warmer air can hold more water vapor than cooler air can. So the warmer it is, the more humid it tends to be because the air can hold more moisture. So think about Florida. If you walk outside at times, sometimes it really feels like you're walking out into a second shower because it's really, really moist in the air. And that's the humidity level. So the higher the temperature, the higher the relative humidity can be. Now, saturated air is something that your textbook talks about, and it's something that relates back to something known as the dew point. So I've defined it here for you. So saturated air is air with a relative humidity of 100%. This basically means that the, the, the air cannot hold any more water, so it is saturated, kind of like a sponge. As the air temperature increases, as long as there's no increase in water vapor, the relative humidity can actually decrease. Because warmer air can hold more, if we're not adding any more moisture to the environment, then the relative humidity will go down. So it's like saying that um, as we go throughout the day, let's say right now, early in the morning, um, we could talk about how there's 20 grams per cubic centimeter that the air can hold, Right now there's only 10 grams per cubic centimeter in the air. So right now we have 50% relative humidity. As we go throughout the day, if the um, temperature rises, air, the, the air can hold more water vapor. So at noon, it might be able to hold 30 grams per cubic centimeter, but we don't add any moisture. So that's the ratio that gets expressed there. And then towards the end of the day, if we have 50 grams of cubic per uh, cubic centimeters of water the air can actually hold, but we still only have 10, again, that's the ratio, 10 to 50. So we're uh, all during the day we can change the relative humidity of the air depending upon the temperature. Now the dew point is the temperature at which condensation occurs. So in this case, this allows the formation of dew, mist or fog. This is like saying that the air is actually saturated at the moment and it changes uh, from water vapor down to condensation. The air can no longer hold any more water vapor. So this allows the formation of dew, mist or fog. If you wake up in the morning and let's say you found uh, some dew on your grass, that means at some point during the evening the dew point, the temperature was dropped enough where it reached saturation. The water vapor can no longer stay as liquid water. Instead, it has to go back to condensation. So in this case, we got the dew on the grass. 
Mr. Fog also happens because of saturated air. Now, in this case, mist and fog, these are actually just types of clouds at ground level. It's kind of cool. You're walking around, you're walking around in a cloud. Now, they do define differences in these three, uh, in three levels, I guess, of these clouds at ground level. One is mist. Now, mist occurs when visibility is between 1,000 meters and 5,000 meters and the relative humidity is usually over 93%. Now for us metric challenged, like myself, I also have this in miles. So the visibility is between 0.64 miles, so over half a mile, and about 3.1 miles. So that's a pretty big range of visibility there. It's not perfect visibility, but you can see for quite some distance. Now fog occurs when visibility is below a thousand meters or uh, just over half a mile. And dense fog usually occurs when visibility is below 200 meters, which is 0.12 miles. So usually if you can't see that far, usually we're in dense fog. Now here in Florida, we do see some fog in the morning. It depends upon where you are. Now for fog or mist to form, some type of condensation nuclei is needed. So this condensation nucleus is a, a dust particle or a salt particle. Now think about it. Here in Florida, we have a lot of salt particles in the air because we are very close to the ocean. So also because these nuclei are more common in urban areas, Mr. Fog forms more often in these places. So not just urban areas. If you happen to be by the beach, um, a lot of times, like Siesta Key in the morning, does have a lot of fog just because, um, not all, it doesn't stay all day, but it's just because there's a lot of salt in the air. Now this condensation nuclei allow uh, the water to attach to it to create that mist. And that's basically how a, how a cloud is formed. It needs something to attach to in order to become, uh, to, be, to become a, I don't want to say a solid piece of water, but in order to sort of form into a water droplet, it needs something to attach to. Now we have two types of fog. One is seen more in pla other places than another. So it depends upon what happens and, and what's happening with the warm and cooler air. It depends on what kind of fog we get. So we have something called advection fog. Advection fog is when warm, moist air flows horizontally over cooler land or sea surface. Now on the left here, we have a picture of sort of what's going on. So we have this warm, moist air moving over a cooler surface. And in this case, it, this cooler surface happens to be water. And because of that, fog is actually forming. So the temperature is dropping in this little case, right along the surface. Now this happens a lot in San Francisco. If you happen to ever go to San Francisco and take a look at the bridge, this happens all the time. Because what's happening is you have warm water flowing in from the city over the cooler water here, and it just creates this really dense fog. And I happen to have been in, Sar uh, Sarasota, in uh, San Francisco when this happened. I was trying to take pictures from afar from the bridge, couldn't because it was just covered in mist. Um, well, fog, actually, not mist. It was just covered. So, unfortunately, this happens tons in San Francisco. Now, radiation fog is what actually occurs most time, and you probably are more aware of radiation fog than you are of advection fog. Advection fog forms in low-lying areas during calm weather when the surface of the ground cools rapidly at night which then cools the air immediately above it. So here, again on the left, we have sort of a picture of what's going on. We have heat radiating from the surface, which is going to cool just at the very bottom, just the air that's touching the surface directly because of con uh, convection, I'm sorry, conduction. So conduction will change and cool that air directly along the surface now because of that, it cools the air rapidly and then it's forming this, um, this fog here 
as cooling continues, it thickens and thickens and thickens. And it's going to rise because of just the amount of, <laughs> it's just basically going to create more and more. So um, at the top, it also starts to cool, and then it's going to deepen it. So it can rise, not because it's warm, but it just rises because there's no space for more fog. So it can rise up a little bit. This is the fog that you probably most can, um, you probably understand the best because this is what normally happens. If you drive around in the morning um, or late at night, sometimes you'll see this. There's a rapid cooling of the surface of the, uh, the, surface of the roads um, or over lakes, and this type of cooling happens, and we get this type of fog. So what's so bad about fog? Well, I think it's kind of cool. However, it can really be an environmental hazard. Airports can shut down, road or train conditions can become really bad, and if this happens a lot, this can lead to economic losses. A lot of times in fog, we get pileups, and I believe a few months ago in Florida, we had one not too, um, not too far from here on I-75, and we had this humongous 40-pile uh, um, car pileup on the road, all because of a truck that tipped over. Um, it jackknifed and all these cars hit into it. It was really, really big, not too far from here. So think of the economic losses from those trucks, from the cars, from the uh, people who can, couldn't go to work and everything. So fog can be pretty bad. Now let's talk about temperature inversions and we will conclude this video. Temperature inversions are relative increases in temperature with height in the lower part of the atmosphere. So we sort of saw this in the very first picture I showed you of the layers of the atmosphere. How I mentioned in the stratosphere, instead with increasing heights, normally what happens, we have temperature decreasing. When the stratosphere, the temperature increases because of the ozone layer. That's normally the case. So in the temperature inversion, we actually get an increase in temperature as we move up in altitude. And just so you know, this is also known as radiation inversion or nocturnal inversion. Not always, I've never really seen this in the textbooks, but the, uh, the A syllabus did mention that these two terms are also used. So if you do interchange these words with temperature inversion, I think they will be okay with that. So, Let's continue. So at night, what happens is that the surface cools more quickly than the surrounding air. A layer of warmer air then sits on top of this cool layer because it, had not, it has not been able to cool down. So that cooler air acts like a little cap and it doesn't allow this warmer air to move down. Remember, warm air likes to, uh, likes to stay up top but as it moves up into the atmosphere, it tends to cool down. But because this cooler air right here is not allowing that warm air to move down, it's, it's kind of capping it. So there's no mixing of these layers here because there's really no air turbulence. There's no wind to kind of drive it through. So if you notice on top, I have the normal picture of what normally happens. Normally what we get is we get the heat radiating off of the atmosphere. Warm air tends to rise, so it wants to rise. But as it's rising, it cools down, and then it eventually begins to sink back. So in a thermal or a temperature inversion, what we get is that the cooling um, happens directly right at the surface. But what happens is that it doesn't Basically, that cooler sits there because it stays close to the ground. It's ha it has sunk, but it's creating this cap, not allowing that warm air to come back down. So we have this inversion, and it can actually become pretty pretty bad in some cases, especially in urban areas. So the temperature inversions can act like a lid, causing pollutants to remain in the lower atmosphere. And here's that little example that cold air is trapping all of that pollution in here, not allowing the warm air to get down. 
So I have two pictures of examples of actually what's going on. And from afar, you can see this, especially in areas of pollution in large industrial cities or even in cities in general. Now, this picture over here, notice we have this yellowish layer. And this is actually the cooler air that is sticking around. But because of this inversion layer, the warmer air is not able to cool down. It is not able to actually come um, while it's rising. It's not able to mix in here and cool itself down as it rises. So this cooler air is acting like a cap. And all of this yellow stuff, all of this is pollution that's kind of been sitting around the city. So it creates this ickiness. <laughs> it, 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 this is the best way I can describe it. This is another picture as well. So you see this thick layer right here. Sometimes we call it smog. And smog is actually, um, it could be part of a temperature inversion at that particular moment. It happens a lot in bigger, bigger cities or areas of large industrial areas. Now this is common in depressions or valleys. And this is why that top picture here sort of has uh, this city sitting in a valley. Of course, you don't really have cities just like this, but um, it's just a representation that it's common in depressions or valleys. And things like frost hollows may develop. And this is basically an area where there's a reduced growth of vegetation. Um, not a lot of people like to sit and farm in those areas because it can't grow anything. Because of these in temperature inversions, it's keeping that, it's trapping that cooler air down here. So vegetation has a tough time to grow in these particular areas. So if we look at temperature inversions, they can be kind of cool, like in our stratosphere, it normally happens, it's okay. But when we're talking about urban areas, it actually can cause a lot of problems due to pollutants, keeping that cooler air trapped in here, not allowing it to move up. The warm air is not able to kind of mix in here and we get this lid that kind of keeps all those pollutants inside.